Hi, and welcome to our Wednesday plenary of the ASFPM conference. I hope that everyone has been having a great virtual conference experience so far and enjoying some really fantastic presentations. My name is Eileen Shader. I am Director of Restoration for American Rivers, where I lead our organization's efforts to promote equitable, integrated, and nature-based flood management solutions. I also serve as co-chair of the Natural and Beneficial Functions Committee for ASFPM. Over the past year, I have had the honor of working with a team of ASFPM volunteers to create a social justice working group dedicated to pursuing just and equitable floodplain management. It's our hope to create a space for ASFPM members to work collaboratively to address inequalities in floodplain management. I've been a proud member of the ASFPM community for almost 10 years, and like you, I believe strongly in our vision of an adaptable nation resilient to flooding and prepared for tomorrow's changing climate. And like you, I think it's important to ensure that our efforts to mitigate current and future losses, costs and human suffering caused by flooding are benefiting all people and communities. But it's become clear that despite our best intentions, the floodplain management exists within a system that disproportionately benefits some members of our society and that flooding events are exacerbating inequalities. So today we have three speakers that are going to help us better understand racial, social, and other inequities, how they intersect with floodplain management, and how we as floodplain managers can work to ensure our efforts to reduce flood risk are benefiting all members of our communities. Uh, during our session today, please go ahead and submit questions in the chat during the presentations. Um, we'll be having a Q&A at the end of our our three videos. Um, and before we get to those fantastic speakers, I need to thank our plenary sponsors, Michael Baker. Um, so please join me in watching our sponsors video. Hello, and welcome to day two of the 45th annual ASFPM Flood Conference. My name is Allison Westland Andrews, and I am one of the directors of the Emergency Management and Response Office at Michael Baker International. I look forward to this conference every year and I'm honored to be here today as your colleague and partner in advancing floodplain management. I am especially excited for our two speakers this morning, Ms. Jacqueline Patterson of the NAACP and Ms. Lori Peake of the Natural Hazard Center. They will be speaking about the important topic of social and environmental justice and managing flood risk. I imagine if Gilbert White were here today, 110 years after he was born, he would be very proud to see these speakers so prominently featured on the agenda. As many of you know, he was a pioneer for issues at the intersection of earth and social sciences. And as the founder of the Natural Hazards Center in Boulder, he's likely smiling down on the conference as his legacy continues. I first learned about Mr. White here at ASFPM. The organization has memorialized his contributions with their prestigious Goddard White Award, which recognizes individuals' work to advance the goals of floodplain management. I was really excited when I stumbled upon the biography of Mr. White at my local thrift store. I'm sure there's at least a few of you in this particular crowd who can identify with my enthusiasm. I read the book last summer and found that he was certainly a fascinating man not only for his contributions to the field of floodplain management, but for the extraordinary life he led. Did you know that early in his career, he had an office in the White House where he overheard President Roosevelt discussing the attack on Pearl Harbor the evening it happened. Reflecting upon that evening later, he recalled questioning the motives for the attack. After this incident, he resolved to always try to assess the possible reasons for others' actions, as well as the indirect effects of his own actions upon others. His desire to understand people's perceptions became a hallmark of Mr. White's approach. It's a lesson we can all take to heart today and keep in mind as we listen to the upcoming speakers. It was also interesting to learn that Mr. White was not pleased with the approach taken at the onset of the NFIP. At that time, large engineering companies, including Michael Baker, performed the first flood risk studies. He would have preferred for the Corps and USGS to play a larger role. In my own career, I have been a beneficiary of those large engineering firms' early involvement in the NFIP. 
I have learned from individuals who have devoted their careers to floodplain management and who ignited a spark in me to follow the same path. The one thing that connects us all is water. It's a necessity and one of FEMA's lifelines essential to human health and safety. However, it is truly a multifaceted natural resource. As we all know, water is also a source of hazards. A peaceful river can quickly spread further into our world, causing flooding and destruction. That is where we are called to intercede, to make the communities where we work and live safer. We do it by creating 2D modeling, communicating about flood risk, or galvanizing mitigation action. We understand the risks associated with water, and we are all key players in supporting communities as they manage their risks and safeguard people and property. At Michael Baker, we strive to bring new and innovative solutions to address these challenges by harnessing the knowledge of our people to make a difference. As we gather here virtually again this year, we invite you to visit our booth and engage with our team to learn more. Please ask them what they are doing to advance our joint mission to reduce the nation's flood losses. We look forward to solving challenges together, always looking toward a brighter and better future for everyone. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you again to Michael Baker for sponsoring this plenary session. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Jackie Peter Patterson, uh, Director of NACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Jackie has served as coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. She has worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, and environmental and climate justice. She served as the senior women's rights policy analyst for Action Aid, where she integrated a women's rights lens to the, for the issues of food rights, macroeconomics, and climate change, as well as the intersection of violence against women and HIV and AIDS. Previously, Jackie served as assistant vice president of the HIV AIDS programs for IMA World Health, providing management and technical assistance to medical facilities and programs in 23 countries in Africa and the Caribbean. She has also served as the Outreach Project Associate for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and Research Coordinator for Johns Hopkins University and as a Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica, West Indies. Maggie holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland and a master's degree in public health from Johns Hopkins University. She currently serves as the International Committee on the U.S. Social Forum, the Steering Committee for Interfaith Moral Action on Climate, Advisory Board for the Center for Earth Ethics, as well as on the Board's Directors for the Institute of the Black World, Center for Story-Based Strategy, and the U.S. Climate Action Network. I am thrilled to have Jackie speaking with us today. So without further ado, let's roll her presentation. So good morning or afternoon, depending on where you all are. It's exciting to be here with you today to talk about the equity implications of, of flooding and the work that the NAACP does in partnership with great groups like the Association of State Floodplain Managers, Climate Central, NOAA, and so forth. So I wanted to really start us with a bit of a grounding. We at the NAACP, Environmental and Climate Justice Program very much ascribed to the PEMAS principles of democratic organizing. And those include letting people speak for themselves and emphasizing bottom-up organizing. And so I always like to start my presentations with the voices of the, the people who are impacted by whatever it is I'm talking about, because often I'm telling people stories when I'd love for people to be able to tell their own stories. And so uh, that's not necessarily practical for, for these various presentations, but as a, as a proxy or a, a substitute at least, then I show video clips where people are telling their stories. So I'm going to start off with one from a, a um, film called Trouble the Water, where it was really um, shot by these folks who were going through the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, and they were telling it from their own um, perspective through their own kind of handheld webcams. And so, um, so here we are um, listening to 
watching and hearing Trouble the Water. My name is Scott Michael Roberts. This is my wife, Kimberly Roberts. We're from New Orleans, the Night War, underwater. And they say it on the news that it's like aiming toward Mississippi so we might get the outskirts. That's the sky. It looks pretty nice. But it sure soon will change. Girl, I hear some thunder. Golly, look at that water, boy! Ooh, Lord! Oh, you see how hot it is? Ooh, Jesus! Ooh, be with us, Lord, please. All this water coming through the windows. Hey, help us get off the roof, man! You're a real hero, boy! We under siege, truly under siege. Everybody done lost everything around here. Now, you have seen what Katrina has done to us. She has stuck us in her attic. I'm running out of juice, too. been expected yet. It could be dead people right now as we speak. Because the, the National Guard, they have not been here. And it's two weeks after the hurricane. And this is one of the Navy bases that Bush had planned to close down. Why can't we stay overnight? What about the women and children? They say, get off our property or we're going to start shooting. We don't need you out here if you try to trouble the water. I don't want to raise your expectations too high. My son wanted to join the army. You're not going to fight for a country that does not give a damn for you. Don't come to our town if you try to trouble the water. The hood always be last to be fixed. I'm living life after Katrina. It's hard out here. You going to make it, one. Okay, we all going to make it. Down south, hustling, they going to trouble the water. I got that heat, but they ain't. I urge the citizens to continue to listen to the local authorities. It's our home, our food, our neighbors, our problem. That's where I want to be at. Katrina is still going on. Night walk. So, hopefully that gave you a bit of a sense of what that looked like for people who are who are having this uh, the frontline experience with flooding and and what, which I'm sure many of you already have 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 uh, experienced but just wanted to get us grounded in that. And so as the NAACP when we first started doing this work around environmental and climate justice there are a lot of questions about what this has to do with our civil rights agenda as uh, uh, where people saw more traditional things like busing or, or you know, busing in terms of the past with school, school integration or voting rights or criminal justice. And it was just a, a leap for people to really see the intersections with issues around environment and climate change. And so our program has evolved over the years as we ourselves have developed a narrative around these intersections. And so we've reached a point where we have a mission statement as the Environmental and Climate Justice Program that says we're advancing the leadership of frontline communities to eliminate environmental and climate injustices and ignite an environmental, social, and economic revolution. And so again, we, we live and breathe to support the leadership of our state and local NAACP on the front lines of these injustices. And so we have our three strategic objectives within a broader kind of a broader framework around just transition and transitioning our society from one that's rooted in extraction, exploitation, domination, and closure of wealth and power and so forth to a, to a living economy that's rooted in cooperation, that's caring for the sacred, including the earth and each of us therein. And, uh, and, and, and principles and practices of regeneration and practicing deep democracy. So that's kind of our, our meta analysis, our larger frame, but the work that we do in terms of our strategic day-to-day -day objectives in terms of our kind of slice in that larger transition, our focus have been focused over these last 10 years on reducing harmful emissions, meaning pollution, particularly greenhouse gases, advancing energy efficiency and clean energy policies and practices as an alternative to the to the pollution that is most responsible for climate change, which is from fossil fuel-based energy production, and then strengthening community resilience in the context of climate adaptation, which is where this work rests around sea level rise and, uh, and flood management. <clears throat> and so we recognize that environmental injustices have a disproportionate impact on communities of color and low-income communities, and that the injustices um, that these communities suffer can be better impacted if we actually had our communities at the table 
again, um, letting people speak for themselves, being the voices that help to, to make the shift that we need to make as a society. And so we really lift up the voices and, and strengthen the capacity and ability of frontline communities to be at the table, telling their own story and helping, helping to shift the narrative. And so whether it's people of color, low income communities, people differently able, people LGBTQ, people, people, immig immig people who are um, immigrating to the United States um, undocumented folks, like all of these different groups are are often le left out of the the decision making tables and our and our role is to really be a bridge and just to keep that bridge strong and intact for people to participate in planning and legislation and so this is just a list of the various disasters and so forth as we think about kind of disaster equity and justice. And so for us, you know, whether it's, uh, as we talk in the context of climate change, we know that the frequency and severity of extreme weather events is in storms, but we you know also snow and other types of uh, flooding is is going to be increasing with uh, with with climate change. It's already increasing, and we also know that sea level rise is, is being um, is is intensifying, and so we are seeing people being displaced by flooding and so forth. And even in the Maldives, they actually had a cabinet meeting underwater in that upper right hand corner is kind of a picture of that. After they built a seawall, it wasn't quite enough as the seas continued to rise. So they actually, in 2009, had a cabinet meeting underwater to say in 20 years, this is literally where we're going to be. So they were having conversations about having to move their entire populace to the Solomon Islands or Papua New Guinea, or they've been negotiating with these different governments to actually have to move their entire population because their lands in less than 10 years are going to be uninhabitable. So, but that's not just there here in the United States, whether it's Thibodeau, um, Norfolk, Virginia, or um, uh, Kivalina in Alaska, all of these places are facing imminent displacement due to sea level rise. And we also know that already the Ile de Jean Charles ban of the Biloxi Chinamaca Choctaw um, have been displaced in southern Louisiana by the combination of sea level rise and, and uh, the land sinking because of subsidence. And so uh, one of these officials from NOAA famously said that today's flood is going to be equal to tomorrow's high tide as a result. So I'll show you this other video, which is really helping to, 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 to really shine a light on these systemic inequities that are, that are making it so that certain communities are most impacted negatively by these, um, by these disasters and the ways that these communities are, are constantly kind of being pushed back from being able to move ahead because of these systemic inequities. So this video kind of tells that picture.
So hopefully that gave you a bit of a sense of what that, uh, of what those inequities are that the communities are constantly battling against. So we see how it plays out with the, uh, with the, with the store not being able to have the housing stock that makes us resistant to the storms and not being able to recover from storms because of lack of insurance, being next to toxic facilities. So when disasters happen, we're more likely to be harmed by if these are overtaken by water or wind damage or whatever. Um, the 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 kind of dire uh, the, the dire circumstances that result in these kind of dramatic rescues for our communities because we're more likely to be in floodplains, less likely to be mobile. The fact that we are more likely to be incarcerated and therefore more likely to be left in harm's way, like the folks who were incarcerated and were abandoned by deputies as the floodwaters rose up, sewage tainted floodwaters rose up in their prison cells. And then, as we talked about, the Velocity Chair Demarca Choctaw, this first official quote unquote climate refugees in the US race against time as we see the climate clock continues to click, tick. And so, you know, United States and across the world, similar kind of circumstances. And then, even the systems that are supposed to help us to recover aren't necessarily catering to the needs of our communities. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, we talk about differential impact, but like I said, not just race or and so forth, but also gender. In the aftermath of Katrina, there was a extreme uptick in sexual violence, and we see that in disasters in general, whether it's the tsunami Katrina, the earthquake in Gujarat, the earthquake in Haiti, uh, the BP oil drilling disaster. In each of these circumstances, there was an uptick in domestic violence and, um, and sexual violence. And when we talk about also the prison population, not only are they more likely, less likely to be cared for, but they're also most likely to be brought, brought into um, action as, as part of the cleanup crew and less likely to actually have the proper protective gear or training to deal with that. So again, the layers of the systemic inequities. And then of course, being undercompensated um, for being put in harm's way. And, um, and and so we, when we talk about the racial dynamics, this is an image that I show because I was after, in the after, aftermath of the uh, flooding and tornadoes of 2011. I took this picture because it just struck me of all the people who were there um, giving out food. They were all white and the people who were lined up at the table who, were, who needed food were all African-American. And so that just really struck me in terms of the disparity of who's able to bounce back, who wasn't impacted in the first place, who who has needs in the times of the, the disaster aftermath. And then this told the same similar story after this is inside that building is where the people were inside getting the food and outside on the stage are the people from the Red Cross, FEMA, the local government who had the information, who had the resources, who knew the ser where the services were to be provided and lined up at the mic down to a person, every little, every last person in this particular moment was an African-American woman um, seeking services services, seeking help, seeking resources, and it just tells the story of that kind of dichotomy. Um, and, and some of the systemic reasons why this even happens um, goes to what kind of in, in, in investments in infrastructure happens. In the aftermath of Hurricane Isaac, someone asked uh, Senator Mary Landrieu why it was that the levees in Plaquemines Parish in Louisiana were reinforced in the seven years since um, Hurricane Katrina. She said she has the Army Corps of Engineers the same question. They said they use a formula to decide which levees would be prioritized for reinforcement. And it was applying points to each levy based on what the economic impact would be if it was overtaken. So it's another situation where it literally legislates that the people who have the 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 most in the way of resistance um, or you know or or resilience to this type of thing? People with higher higher income properties and so forth, higher value properties, are the ones who are get the protection, or who are going to get the protection, and those who have the least ability to protect themselves. People who are living in floodplains with substandard housing stock and so forth are going to get the least protection. So it's literally legislated through that formula. Mm -hmm. Then we also look at other layers like the race and the the two folks who were just two images from Associated Press. One showed white folks who were quote unquote wading through chest, chest deep floodwaters after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. But when it was a young African American man, it said the young man walks through chest deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store. And so same activity, same circumstances, and yet we have this. Um, 
the situation where people are being characterized as looting when they're black, but they're just surviving and finding when they're white. And so this is what leads to criminalization um, based on race and what leads to what happened in terms of the Danziger Bridge where people were just trying to survive, going back into town to look for food, look for relatives. And they were, people called the police on them and they the police came and shot and killed these unarmed families who were just trying to survive. So as we talk about the types of um, remedies that we need to make, um, we, we, we also recognize that, that this shows up as it relates to undocumented folks who are coming in to immigrate after the US being 4% of the global population, but 25% of the emissions to drive climate change. When people are trying to immigrate because their crops have died out or, 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 or dried up or because their lands have become uninhabitable because of disasters and they come to the United States seeking, seeking help, then instead of providing refuge and taking responsibility for our actions Actions that made their lands uninhabitable. Instead, we put people in cages. This is a quote from Warshan Shire, a Kenyan-born Somali poet. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So another video to just show you briefly um, where these two sisters are, are, are really telling the story about these um, systemic inequities and who, who's profiting from some of these uh, systemic inequities and in, in what happens in the aftermath. So climbing poetry, uh, hopefully you'll enjoy that. They are selling the, the rain. rain. They are leasing the, the rivers. They are auctioning off the ocean to, to the highest bidders as, as giant, giant chunks, chunks of the polar ice cap dislodge from the North Pole. And tourists flock to the site to take pictures. There, there is disaster tourism. tourism. Like there's disaster profiteering. Off the torrential storms. And the warring and the wrath of global warming. Who will get paid to, to rebuild? And who will they build for? Who will endure the, the drought and the rain? Who will be safe and sound indoors? Who, who built the missiles, the smart bombs, the rockets? Who gets raided? And who gets paid from whose pockets? Who, who gets sent off to war? Who dies for whose profits? Who gets remembered? Who's been forgotten? Congressman Richard Baker said, we, we finally cleaned up public housing in New Orleans. We couldn't do it, but God did. Rid the city of the poor. Rebuild the city for the rich. With contractors from everywhere but New Orleans coming in. Folks in the projects were forced to evacuate, even where Katrina didn't hit. Then armed guards blocked the doorways, wouldn't let the residents back in. Demolition scheduled while people live in tents under our 10. And thousands driven out the south are still scattered across the states as New Orleans is looted by profiteers who want to make over its face. Flood the lower ninth to save the wealthier estates as Mississippi renovates with slot machines and condos. So you gotta win the lotto if you plan to keep your place. It's the, the same. same. From gulf to gulf, the chip stackers turn disaster into profit, reaping billions off the damage that they started in New Orleans. Port-au-Prince, Iraq, Iraq, paychecks from tax dollars for no big contracts. So Halliburton can rebuild the pillage that they plotted. So I'll just wrap up by saying that there is much that we can do in terms of addressing these inequities in terms of policy. So we've come together, brought folks together to really talk about the core principles of equity and flood flooding and emergency management, including making sure that the human rights is at the center of our planning, that we are upholding people's rights to land, clean water, clean food. And so, I mean, uh, you know, nutritious foods, that we talk about this just transition um, as our underpinning of everything that we do, as I talked about before, from an extractive economy to a living economy, that we really look at the various stages of prevention and mitigation that really looks at um, centering human rights and how we do this. And so 
this you'll you'll all have um, access to this, which kind of tells more. But I want to make sure we're getting through, making sure we use local knowledge as we do this planning is critical as as well. So again, you'll I'm just zipping by these, and you'll have access to these afterwards. But these are just some of the ways that we put. And you'll you, you actually we actually have a couple of toolkits, including our. Um, in the eye of the storm toolkit that has all of the information that I'm zipping by now. But so overarching recommendations for policy, risk assessments that are you know rooted in public health and human rights, um, developing projections that are done with the local communities, um, making sure that we're really focusing on um, reducing vulnerability or eliminating vulner vulnerability, um, making sure that we are um, preserving cultural heritage, even as we um, preserve properties, um, making sure that we follow some of the model policies that are out there, the coastal overlay zone policy that they have in Green Greenwich, um, Connecticut, the uh, con conservation, e the way that they use conservation easements in the ch city of Chesapeake, the uh, buffer zone work that they're doing in California, um, the work that they're also doing in California around the coastal wetlands restoration, the stormwater management work that's happening in Chicago, also Washington, D.C., or Howard County has some great coastal management work. And just finally wrapping up again with the NAACP resources that we have, the NAACP the Storm Toolkit, our communities, our power toolkit, we have our uh, certification program on equity and emergency management and climate resilience. We have another certification program that we're doing again with the Association of State Floodplain Managers called uh, the NAACP Sea Level Rise and Flood Management Certification Program. And then just wrapping up with the type of ways that we need to think about how we do this engagement. So we're all working together, making sure that we're rooted in anti-oppression um, design and cultural sensitivity, that we are really rooted, our, rooting our work in intersectionality and tackling root causes, building on local knowledge and leadership. And that we are thinking even in terms of the practical things, making sure that we're providing information in an accessible way, organizing meetings in an accessible way. So this is just an image of the NAACP, what, what happens when it works, the NAACP in Florida holding up their certificates that they got from doing this two-day training that we did, um, so their, their uh, certificates from FEMA. So looking forward to our Q&A together, and thank you all so much for listening. Take care. Thank you so much, Jackie, for that phenomenal presentation. Uh, very powerful and judging by the uh, number of comments and questions coming in, um, certainly giving us a lot to consider and, and talk about within ASFPM. Our second speaker is Lori Peek, Professor of the Department of Sociology and Director of the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado Boulder. She studies marginalized populations in disasters and is the author of Behind the Backlash, Muslim Americans After 9-11, co-editor of Displaced, Life in the Katrina Diaspora, and co-author of Children of Katrina. He also helped develop and write school safety guidance for the United States, which resulted in the publication of FEMA's uh, P-1000, Safer, Stronger, Smarter, A Guide to Improving School Natural Hazard Safety. She's the director of the National National Science Foundation funded Converge facility, which is dedicated to improving research coordination and advancing the ethical conduct and scientific rigor of disaster research. She also leads the NSF supported social science extreme events research and inter interdisciplinary science and engineering extreme events research networks. She was recently nominated by President Biden to serve on the board of directors for the National Institute of Building Sciences and is the past president of the International Sociological Association Research Committee on Disasters and past chair of the American Sociological Association section on environmental sociology. She's a board member for the Bill Anderson Fund, which is an initiative dedicated to increasing the number of persons of color in hazards mitigation and disaster research. Uh, she received her PhD in sociology from the University of Colorado Boulder in 2005. I was able to attend my first Natural Hazard Center workshop last year and was blown away by Lori's ability to gracefully and thoughtfully center data-driven justice and equity in discussions of natural hazards mitigation. Um, so I'm thrilled to uh, have her here to speak with us today. Uh, Lori Peek. 
Thank you so much to ASFPM for inviting me to be a part of this panel focused on social and environmental justice in managing flood risk. I am so honored to be here with you today. I want to actually open my presentation today with a question that I know that many of us have grappled with in our research as well as our practice. How much does mitigation actually save? And an accompanying question, how can we best articulate the social value of mitigation? I think these questions are incredibly important and they grow ever more pressing by the day because we are trapped in a disaster loss spiral in the United States where losses from floods, hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfire, and other hazards currently average over $100 billion per year. And in 2017 alone, for example, these losses exceeded 300 billion. This disaster loss spiral now affects millions of Americans annually, where uh, 89 million of our fellow residents are exposed to hurricane hazards, 56 million to earthquake, 3 million to wildland urban interface fires, and 4 million to floods. And of those people, as well. And of course, not all people are exposed equally with those at the margins of society, including the poor, people of color, children, the elderly, and others with fewer resources and less power, bearing disproportionate harm when disaster does. These are also the groups that we know have the hardest time recovering. And so with that context in mind, I return to the central focusing question for this presentation of how much does mitigation actually save? And how much does it save when we take both quantifiable as well as seemingly unquantifiable losses into account? So how much does mitigation save when we move beyond the buildings and also begin talking about the diverse people who can perhaps most benefit from mitigation actions? So to answer our question of how much does mitigation actually save, I think it is crucial that we couple the most rigorous statistical analyses and the most robust data that's available with stories. Not only because this might give us even better science when we couple statistics with stories, but also because that is where I think we can begin to make the most compelling argument for the social value of mitigation. When we provide those hard numbers to people, but we also soften them with words and narratives that actually matter in the context of people's lives. And so let's start out with those numbers. Um, as I know many of you are aware, the Natural Hazard Mitigation Saves 2019 report represents the most exhaustive available benefit cost analysis of natural hazard mitigation from adopting up-to-date building codes and exceeding codes to addressing the retrofit of existing buildings and the utility of transportation infrastructure. So as you can see here in this graphic from the seminal report that again was released in 2019, um, the overall benefit cost ratio for the perils studied, including flood, hurricane surge, wind, earthquake, and wildland urban interface fire, was 11 to 1, meaning that for every $1 we invest in um, mitigation, we can save up to $11. And of course, that overall number, as you can see in the graphic, varies by hazard. It varies if we actually go above code, um, if we're engaging in retrofit, et cetera. But the message across hazard type and across mitigation intervention is clear, that mitigation does save. But then we return back to this question of how much does mitigation actually save? Because as com comprehensive and as extraordinarily important as those analyses from the 2019 report are, 
one of the things that the uh, report authors who are leading researchers and practitioners in this area acknowledge is the following, and I'm going to quote chapter four of this report at length, because I think it's making a really important point that I'm hoping we can consider more thoroughly today. So in chapter four, the authors write the following, that disaster researchers have not yet produced a systematic method to quantify all losses that occur in a disaster. So we know, for example, that disasters disconnect people from friends, schools, work, and familiar places. They ruin family photos and heirlooms and alter relationships. Large disasters may cause permanent harm to culture and one's way of life and impact the most socially and financially marginal people. Disasters may have long-term consequences for health and collective well-being. These events also often hurt and kill pets and destroy natural ecosystems that are integral parts of communities. Disasters clearly disrupt life's arc in ways that are hard to express, let alone assign monetary worth. Even the potential for future disasters affects people's peace of mind. Mitigation saves more than is estimated in this report. And so one of the takeaways, right, that the authors are offering us is that for as powerful as those numbers are, and as much as we need to use them when we are working in communities and with diverse people trying to express the social value of mitigation, it's important that we never lose sight of the fact that those numbers are conservative estimates that aren't yet capturing all that can be saved when we mitigate from the harm that can be caused by natural hazards. And so this is when I think the potential for coupling the statistics with the stories can be quite powerful when we work in communities. And to that end, I actually want to share with you now a story from one of the hundreds of children who fellow sociologists Alice Fothergill and I interviewed and followed for many years following Hurricane Katrina. And in our book, Children of Katrina, we trace the experiences and the recovery trajectories of a sample of young people who were living in New Orleans at the time of Hurricane Katrina and found their lives upended by that disaster. And so now I wanna introduce you to one of the boys who we write about in Children of Katrina and who we've had the honor of knowing in the many years since the storm. And so in the book, we call this young boy Daniel. He was 12 years old at the time of Katrina, and he and his mother, as well as his baby sister, were living on the outskirts of New Orleans in a, a public housing unit um, where they had lived prior to the storm. Daniel's dad had tragically passed away in 2004, and so he lost his father. He was uh, there in the city going to school, getting ready to start his sixth grade school year when Katrina approached. And one of the things that Daniel told us about his life even before the storm started was the following. He said, since Katrina, we've been having it hard ever since before Katrina, going from pillar to post, shelter to shelter, stuff like that. And so to put a face to the terminology that we oftentimes use in the field related to social vulnerability, by almost any indicator, Daniel, as well as his family, would have been considered socially vulnerable prior to the storm. Then, of course, as we all know, Hurricane Katrina approached the uh, Gulf Coast in the late summer of 2005. And Daniel continued his story to tell what he and his family did the night before Katrina's landfall. So he said, the night before Katrina, it was raining and it was so stormy. I thought it was just another storm, something like Tropical Storm Cindy. We survived Cindy before Hurricane Katrina. I went to sleep that night and something just didn't feel right. So I said, mama, why don't we go get up and move to the back room, put the mattress in the back room because that's the safest place in the house. And so Daniel and his family, they were no stranger to hurricanes. They knew the warnings that had been issued for the city, but his family didn't have an automobile, which was the primary method to try to evacuate the city. So they didn't have an automobile. 
They didn't have any savings or any cash on hand to be able to evacuate at the end of the month. Um, and they had uh, his baby sister that was there to care for. They didn't have family members who were outside of the city who they could have evacuated to go to their homes or could, who could have helped them to get out of the city before the storm. So it wasn't that Daniel and his family didn't understand the impending risk. It was that they didn't have the resources to evacuate in advance of that storm. And so as Dan Daniel and his mother and his baby sister did get up and move, the night before the storm, they went into that back room and they slept on the mattress on the floor. And they, like thousands of other New Orleanians who were left behind in the storm, awoke on the morning of August 29, 2005. And Daniel and his family, they thought that they had, quote, dodged a bullet, uh, that the storm had passed overhead and they were going to be fine. But then they, like, about 100,000 other residents who were in the city at the time that the city started to fill with water. They woke up and they were on the second floor of this apartment where they lived and the water started rising and rising and rising. And it was Daniel who was the one who came up with an idea because his mother um, was getting increasingly agitated because she had the baby sister to care for. And so he actually took a bed sheet, he tied the baby sister to his mother's chest and then because Daniel could swim, he helped to navigate them through the water. They ended up seeking shelter at the Superdome. And after five days in the city, they were eventually evacuated via van to a shelter in Baton Rouge. And so Daniel's story typifies what we refer to in Children of Katrina as cumulative vulnerability. And so this is something I think is really important as floodplain managers as we're working in communities before, during, and potentially after a disaster to think about that pre-existing status of the persons who we're working with, to think about experiences in disaster, and then to think about how that uh, affects post-disaster recovery experiences. So to draw on Daniel's experience again, and to help to illustrate this concept of cumulative vulnerability. Before the disaster, again, Daniel and his family they were living in a low-income household. They had few resources, limited social networks, um, limited educational, social, and cultural capital to draw on in terms of mitigating or preparing for disaster. Then during the disaster, we know that oftentimes people who are in the most vulnerable states then experience the most life-threatening um, evacuations in the disaster. They're the most likely to be exposed to life threat to experience additional trauma in the context of a disaster. And then after a disaster, we can see these additional uh, vulnerability factors that continue to accumulate. So a lack of savings, a lack of resources to draw on to prompt recovery, uh, displacement experiences that can further disrupt an already disrupted life and so forth. And so this is just a visual representation about thinking for thinking about vulnerability and how vulnerability isn't a static state. It's not attached to uh, just a, a single person or a group of people. Instead, vulnerability is dynamic and it's something that can build and accumulate over time. For Daniel and his family, one of the ways that Katrina it, what exacerbated their pre-existing state was that they ended up being displaced multiple times so New Orleans was the city where Daniel and his little sister were born. It was the only place he had ever lived before Katrina. But in the aftermath of Katrina, he and his family ended up moving multiple times to multiple locations across the United States. And in fact, Daniel and his family moved so many times in the seven years that we were following him and his family after the storm as a part of our research that Alice and I ended up making this map to try to track where were all of the places that he was living, where were the different places where he was in or out of school, uh, what was happening with his family at different time moments following this disaster. And so some of the takeaway messages that we learned from Daniel's story and that tie into this idea of cumulative vulnerability are as follows. That Daniel experienced a life-threatening and highly traumatic evacuation with his family. He ended up moving 12 times in seven years. 
And I want to pause on that for a minute because one of the things that we know from child development experts is every time a child moves, it takes them about six months to uh, rebuild any networks, to reorient to a new neighborhood, a new school, et cetera. And so while Daniel was at the high end of the spectrum in terms of the number of moves and disruptions that he experienced after Katrina, he certainly wasn't alone in terms of the number of, of moves that, experience, that he experienced after that storm. He, he and his family also lost the public housing assistance that they had before the storm, and this left them and their family in an incredibly precarious state. They lost crucial sources of social and cultural support that they had had in the city before the storm happened, but then with the mass displacement of persons who were disproportionately African American after the storm, this also further exacerbated his disaster losses and delayed his recovery. In the end, we calculated that Daniel, because of the number of moves and the facts that, that he was in and out of different schools, he missed over two years of his schooling during that 12 to 18 year old period following Hurricane Katrina during his critical adolescent development. He also ended up dropping out of a prestigious performing arts high school in New Orleans that he had been accepted to several years after Katrina. And um, when we asked him why, it certainly wasn't due to a lack of motivation. It was really due to a lack of academic preparation because of the amount of school that he had missed in the aftermath of the storm. And in the end, Daniel and his family who were already living at the economic margins were pushed even deeper into the basement of poverty and ended up experiencing bouts of homelessness and where they were separated from one another. And so after listening to that story, that is a real story of one boy's life, I again return to this question of how much does mitigation actually save if through investments in mitiga mitigation and preparation, we could have averted um, those moves and the disruptions and the loss of schooling and the loss of home and the loss of social networks that Daniel experienced, then I would ask you, what is the dollar of value that you would assign to mitigation activities that could have averted those losses for Daniel? And so I invited you to zoom in to one young boy's story, but now I wanna zoom back out and to remind us that Hurricane Katrina, as so many of you well know because of your own involvement in, in this particular disaster, Katrina affected 90,000 square miles that were declared a federal disaster area. It left 80% of the city of New Orleans submerged, not to speak of the many other communities and cities along the Gulf Coast that were badly disrupted. And so with that one story of Daniel in mind, it's important to remember that there were many tens of thousands of young people who shared some or many elements of Daniel's story of disruption and displacement. And we know this because we know that Katrina damaged or destroyed some 2.5 million homes, 10,000 businesses, and 150 schools. The National Center on Missing and Exploited Children estimates that some 5,000 children were separated from their parents. 372,000 school-aged children were displaced as a result of Katrina. And two years after the storm, 160,000 of those children remain dislocated. And five years after the storm, some of the best mental health research that we have shows that exposed children were five times as likely as comparable non-exposed children to be suffering from serious emotional disturbance. As we zoom out like that and we think about the power of mitigation and what mitigation could do in terms of, again, averting the harm and suffering and disruption that children as well as adults experience as a result of disaster, I again invite you to consider is the one to six or one to 11 ratio, is that the, the right ratio for us to be using? Or how can we broaden our analyses and broaden our stories to take that into account? And so how much does mitigation actually save? I think we need to add sort of two additional dimensions in order to answer this question more fully. So we need to know more about 
building and building codes indeed, which has been at the center of many of our mitigation analyses, including our mo most robust analyses. But we also need to know more about the value of land use planning and also about the people, the people who are posed to most benefit from mitigation actions. And I would argue that when we do not consider social context in this sort of way, and especially when we don't consider the social vulnerability of the populations of people that we are talking about in, in when we have discussions about mitigation, that we may be dramatically underestimating the economic and social value of mitigation. And I'm gonna close with one more case example from research to try to really drive home this point about when we don't think about social context and we, when we don't think about social vulnerability and how mitigation may actually have a differential um, influence across population groups that we, again, may be underestimating its value. And that means we're underselling it in communities. And so the additional case example I wanna give you is actually at the opposite end of the spectrum of the qualitative uh, case study example I gave you from Children of Katrina. Now I'm going to give you an example from the research that I had the chance to work with two brilliant engineers, Elena Setley and John Vandalent. And so something that Elena, John, and I were really interested in was this idea of creating a truly coupled socioeconomic and engineering framework because we know oftentimes social scientists like myself, we're working over here in our silo. Engineers are working over here in their silo, looking at buildings, we're looking at people, and we wanted to figure out how can we come together to create a more robust framework that highlights the importance of including social, economic, demographic, and engineering factors in estimating uh, initial costs of mitigation, losses, planning, and recovery efforts. And so what we did was we actually worked together with Elena as our lead um, to really figure out how to create such a coupled framework would take into account the building stock and building framework, but would also take into account factors like age of the population, race and ethnicity, family structure. So is it a two parent family or single parent family, gender, socioeconomic status, the built environment, as well as building performance. And so the question we were trying to answer in our work was this, what is the social value of mitigation? And in order to answer that question, we actually looked at one hazard type. So to all of my friends who are floodplain managers out there, I forgive us because we were looking at earthquakes rather than floods, but please know that we hope that this model that we introduced actually could transfer across hazard types. But in this model and for the purposes of specificity, we're looking at one hazard, earthquake. We're looking at one building type, soft story wood frame construction, which we know is oftentimes responsible for many of the losses in earthquakes. We are looking at one strategy, retrofit. We're looking at one case study community, the city of Los Angeles. And then we were taking into account multiple socio-demographic considerations. And so working with Elena and John, they uh, developed a series of models to try to answer this question of what is the social value of mitigation? And so one of the things that they did in uh, estimating the social value of mitigation, we looked at a variety of factors, again, related to initial cost of mitigation, economic losses, and so forth. And something that we did in this work was trying to understand what happens when you do and do not take socio-demographic factors and social vulnerability considerations into account. And I would be more than happy to share the papers that talk about the model and have the analyses. But for the purposes of the presentation today, I just wanna give you the takeaway, which is this. So when we do take uh, social vulnerability and social demographic characteristics into account, when it comes to trying to understand the value of retrofit as one major form of mitigation, one of our big takeaway findings is that mitigation is indeed about reducing economic loss, but it's also about improving social justice outcomes. And so what do I mean when I say that? Something we showed in this model is that when you start to take these differences into account, 
the percentages look relatively small. So there's sort of a 2% gain when you think about uh, when you bring the social variables into account. But one of the arguments that we make is that while these look like small percentages, these percent differences actually equate to somewhere between 1.1 billion and 200 million for each percent change. And what that meant was in total in this model was that over $43 billion could be saved through engaging in the retrofit strategies that we were looking at in the work. We did a similar modeling for looking at reducing deaths, injury, and PTSD and what happens in our model when we do and don't take into account social factors. And so again, you can sort of see there were these different percent differences that emerge when you start taking into account social factors. And again, our takeaway, mitigation is about reducing harm and injury, but it's also about improving social justice outcomes because we know, and we showed in this work, that the persons who are disproportionately likely to be injured or harmed or are the poor, people of color and other persons at the margins of society. And one of the key findings of our work was that over 30,000 people, including the most vulnerable, could be safe from injury, fatality or PTSD um, in the context of this scenario in Los Angeles in an earthquake hazard. And so mitigation is about speeding recovery and enhancing social justice in communities. And we found that to illustrate this point that retrofitting in our case study reduced recovery time by 52% or some 61 weeks. And so this was all a way of showing that again, when we don't consider socio-demographic factors that we're actually underestimating the power of mitigation. And when we consider socio-demographic factors, what we're really saying is we're considering people and we're thinking about the diverse people who are in communities. And so in the end, what are the takeaway messages that I'd like to leave with today? And I hope we will have time to discuss during the Q&A. And I'm especially eager to hear about what is working and what's not working in your communities when it comes to telling the story of the power of mitigation and why mitigation matters so much. So in the end, it's important to remember that mitigation involves so much more than buildings that mitigation involves deeply human stories. And we need to tell those stories more often. We need to tell the stories of what happens when we don't mitigate. And that is the lesson of Daniel's story. What happens to people and the incredible disruption that can follow disaster. But we also need to tell the story of what can happen when we do mitigate and people are able to remain in their homes, running their businesses, kids remain in school and so forth. And so these are deeply human stories that move beyond the built environment into our social world and what matters in people's lives in addition to the buildings where they live. Second takeaway, we know that current best estimates of what mitigation saves actually underestimate the social and cultural value of mitigation. Almost everyone agrees on this fact that it's not that the work isn't fantastic that's out there, it's just that it's really hard to measure many of the dimensions of our social life. And that means that it's important that when we're using those numbers, we never lose sight of the fact that they are still not even, they're not coming close to capturing all that mitigation can actually save. Third takeaway, those underestimates are even greater when we don't consider population diversity, social vulnerability, and social justice goals that may be related to mitigation. And so if the poor and the marginalized are the ones who suffer first and worst in disasters, then we can think about how mitigation can actually be applied as a tool in our communities to reduce social vulnerability and also to advance social and economic justice goals. Fourth takeaway, we are living in a time of radical economic inequality. There are a very small number of people at the top uh, possess disproportionate wealth resources and other uh, goods of great value. And so what that means is that many, many millions of Americans are living in poverty or near po poverty. And so this is a time of radical inequality. And it is very important to, uh, for us to have serious conversations where we clarify what are our values, priorities, and actions around mitigation. And there isn't going to be just one answer to that. But instead, these are really important conversations to be held at the community level to honor 
that different communities may have different goals around social and economic justice, around reducing social vulnerability. And then finally, a final takeaway that I think it is so important that we say over and over and over when we are in communities and talking about mitigation, the mitigation is not just about what's replaceable because people oftentimes do think of homes as something that can be rebuilt, a business, a school, as, as physical entities that can be rebuilt. And so moving away from talking about mitigation is something that about things that are replaceable and instead Thank you so much for listening today. It's been an honor to join with you, and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation to follow. Thank you, Lori. Our final speaker today, um, before we transition to the Q&A, is uh, Paul Huang from uh, ser currently serving in the role of Acting Associate Administrator of Resilience at FEMA. In, in his prior position as the Assistant Administrator for the Federal Insurance Directorate, I uh, supported the National Flood Insurance for excuse me, the National Flood Insurance Hazard Mitigation Planning Program and the Dam Safety Program with the goal of providing quality data that increases risk awareness that ultimately drives mitigation actions in communities resulting in long-term resiliency. Uh, he is the uh, Department of Homeland Security Level 3 Program Manager and holds a BS in Management Science and Information Systems as well as a Master's in Business Administration working in the field of flood hazard mapping, insurance, and mitigation for over 10 years, and previously was an information technology consultant. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today to talk more about FEMA's efforts to advance justice and equity. Hi, everyone. This is Paul Wong. Um, currently, the Acting Associate Administrator for Resilience at FEMA. Uh, ASFPM is one of my favorite conferences and reflecting in my 15 years at FEMA, uh, I believe it's the conference I have gone to the most and I miss seeing everyone in person and a lot of the networking uh, and connecting that we do in the hallways typically at ASFPM. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to get more engaged, uh, get more folks engaged and ensure that we're safe. Um, so I hope to see you guys soon in person, perhaps in the near future. Um, but thank you so much for always having a great agenda, um, some fantastic topics, and being such good partners to FEMA. As you know, the Biden administration has identified seven immediate priorities, including COVID-19, economy, equity, climate change, healthcare, immigration, and, and restoring America's global standing. You know, today's topic is one that is absolutely in one of that, those priorities, which is equity, and it's a space that is near and dear to my heart. Um, We've seen it year in, year out. When I go out to the field and you meet families, uh, you not just only see it with your eyes, but you see it with data, that the, the storms and, and the impacts of severe weather and, and climate um, disproportionately affect those uh, most socially vulnerable and most in need. And it's unfortunate we have to make a change, and I'm glad it's a priority in this administration. Um, so excited to, to see change, and we're already starting to see change, but there's a lot more to do. I'd like to start with just a quick story. I mean, I'm a, for those that know me, I'm a huge Warren Buffett fan. When I was getting my MBA over a decade ago, I was able to go shadow him for a day. So I've been a loyalist ever since. And uh, just a couple weekends ago, uh, the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting in which Warren Buffett talks for three and a half hours and takes questions was on. So he's fresh in my mind. But when we met him, we knew that he was going to give away most of his fortune. Uh, the man's worth uh, $100 billion plus dollars, and he's uh, uh, earmarked 99.7% of that money to go to charities. So it's fantastic and uh, a great a gift to society. So we asked him why he was doing that after accumulating all this wealth over the years. Why are you giving it away? And his answer was really simple. He said uh, he felt that he was lucky. And he, he told a story in which he said there was a, if there was a baby in a womb that was a, a genie visited and the genie said, hey, you look like a special child. I'm going to grant you a wish. Uh, and the baby says, what's the wish? And, he's, and he says, 
you're going to be able to be born into any society that uh, that you'd like. And the baby says, well, what's the catch? And the catch really is that the genie says you can be born uh, poor or rich, a minority in your community. You could be born with one parent or two. You could have a disability. You, you have no idea. What kind of society would you like to be born in? And of course, that baby would want to be born in a society where they have an even shot, no matter the circumstance they were born into, right? So he's giving away his money to create a more equitable society, which I really love. And it's a great story in that I believe as we tackle equity in FEMA and the FEMA programs, that we have to think about that. How do we make this fair for everyone? So uh, as part of some of the executive orders and also um, what the National uh, NAC has, National Advisory Council has asked us to do at FEMA, they've asked us to look at uh, measurement. How do we measure equity uh, in our programs? Uh, what is our equity standard? And as we try to develop that, that's a really tricky question. Uh, part of it is we don't have all the data needed. And we have to really identify what is success in this arena. We have such a vast number of programs. We need to understand, you know, what was the intent of this program? Are we delivering this fair? Are there barriers? So we started by creating an executive steering committee at FEMA. Uh, that steering, executive uh, enterprise steering group is really going to look at a definition for equity across the agency. It's also going to look at our plans and policies to ensure that we're effectively integrating equity in all we do. Additionally, we're collecting data. This is tricky. Um, we recently launched the National Risk Index, which includes a social vulnerability layer. But there often our programs are, don't classically collect information like income or race. So collecting that and, and ensuring that we protect the privacy of those that we're supporting is a, is a real balance that we'll have to, to think about when we develop this equity standard. We're open to your suggestions and help on what this equity standard could be, and in particular programs, what success looks like. And those are really good questions that we need to start asking and, and collecting the insights on before we land on what that equity standard could be. We're already starting to do things. Uh, I'd like to tell another example of, of something I've been thinking about, and that's barriers into our programs. Uh, and they're very simple. Um, during the COVID event, uh, one of the good things about COVID, you know, maybe not so good, is my kids only go to school four days a week, and two days of those are virtual. Um, they get Mondays off. So one day we're going to look back and, and say, hey, kids, we used to go to school five days a week. Um, but that one day off has been really great in that we asked the kids, and they actually found it themselves, to volunteer their time. So every Monday I take them out around noon, and they volunteer for two hours at a local church. Uh, it's a food pantry. So one day I dropped them off and I went across the street to, to the grocery store and I walked in and there was blackberries on sale for 99 cents, normally about $3. And it said, use a digital coupon. So I grabbed a, a tin of blackberries. Um, another lady uh, in front of me also grabbed the same pint of blackberries. And as we were checking out later, she was getting rung up um, at the cashier, cash, res cash, cash register and uh, they rang up as $3. And she said, hey, I thought they were 99 cents. And the cashier said, uh, ma'am, you have to use the digital coupon. And she said, I don't know how to do that. How do I use a digital coupon? And he said, well, you have to have the app and then you have to download the coupon and tie it to your card. And she had no idea. That, that barrier alone made her say, you know what? I don't want those Blackberries. And I thought to myself, is this fair? You know, did we create a barrier here where I was easily, I was able and capable because I had the technology um, and the access to, to use that coupon and she didn't. That didn't seem fair to me. And I even reflected more as I left that line thinking, gosh, how lucky am I to have access to these things? How lucky am I that I have the ability to go buy groceries and not really blink an eye about what the bill looks like while my kids across the street are filling bags and bags of food for uh, those that can't afford food for their families. It could be very easily that I, I through no, circum no doing of my own, 
be in the circumstance in which I would be in the line trying to get the, the food across the street, or that I wouldn't have the capabilities of actually accessing something as silly as a digital coupon, right? Okay. So it made me think about what barriers do we have in our programs uh, that create in, in, inequity and fairness. Uh, I saw that firsthand um, a couple weeks ago when I was able to visit our Atlanta Community Vaccination Center. As many of you guys know, uh, we're helping, FEMA is helping lead the efforts uh, on COVID-19 vaccinations, and we've established community vaccination centers across the country. It's such a great uh, effort because we've thought about delivering this in an equitable way. And when you put that lens on, you start delivering in a different way. Um, so the first thing we did was we have a committee um, in the National Response Center that is working to look at data, to talk interagency, to talk to locals and states, to look at demographics, to figure out where best to locate these so that we are locating in areas where there is social vulnerable, socially vulnerable communities, minority communities, and ensuring that these sites have good accessibility. So when I, when I went down to Atlanta, the site was actually at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, home of the Atlanta Falcons. And they located there because of the demographics. It was, it's adjacent to a very social vulnerable community. It's a large minority community and it had public transport. So people could come and get their shots. Additionally, we started thinking about, okay, when do we need to open these centers? And it's not eight to five. We open as early as six in some days and close as late as midnight on others to make sure that those that are working perhaps hourly jobs um, that can't break away from work regular hours could have the time and the ability to access uh, a vaccine shot. Additionally, back to that BlackBerry example, uh, knowing that everyone doesn't have the technology or the time or the expertise to, um, to sign up and schedule an appointment, we opened walk-up lines. And walk-up lines were available to anyone. Uh, in fact, the wait times were only eight to 10 minutes. The biggest obstacle is me putting in the day I volunteered, uh, putting in everyone's data. I, I registered two homeless individuals myself, and we didn't turn away anyone. Uh, so you could get in line, no questions asked, 10 minutes, uh, get your shot, sit in the waiting area, um, and you're, you're good. Come back a couple weeks later. It was a great example of if we have a common goal, we can work the whole community, both the private sector with Arthur Blank Sports, uh, who is giving us the stadium rent free, uh, the local government, Fulton County, uh, Georgia Emergency Management, and FEMA, Department of uh, Defense, National Guard. It was a great uh, whole community effort with a common goal and common mission delivered in the lens of equity. And I really think that is the model in which we need to start thinking about our programs. Another area that I wanna talk about is in the, in the space that you guys are very familiar with, with the National Flood Insurance Program, we're delivering risk rating 2.0 equity in action this year. It's a great way to look at policy and understand that within our policy controls, um, we can fix inequities. So how we rate premiums for the last 40, 50 years has been inequitable in that we've never considered home values. Uh, the example I like to provide is my home is luckily a, I'm fortunate enough to have a fill-in home right, that is uh, new and very expensive next to my neighbor's 1950s home, which is about half the value. We are at the exact same flood risk, but we, and we pay the exact same premium. The, re the, the reality is an inch of water in my home would cost the National Flood Insurance Program a lot more than my neighbor's home. So we should really, to be fair, consider their home value and have them pay a lower premium. So we're addressing that inequity in our programs, and that's a really important thing. And we're gonna see that across the nation. In addition, we're working closely with the administration in the Hill on affordability solutions through statute. So we gotta look at our policies. We have to look at our uh, regulations and we have to look at our statutes, statutes to fix these inequities. If you think about what we're doing in the National Flight Insurance Program around home values, let's apply that to our large grant programs where cost benefit is one of the biggest drivers to winning right, uh, a grant. But of course, the benefit is greater when the home value or the structure or the infrastructure is more expensive, which tends to, through I don't think any type of malintent, favor those homes and those structures and those communities that are actually more expensive and well off. Um, so we have to fix those inequities as well. We're already starting with the Building Resilient Infrastructure Communities Program, 
Um, I'm excited that in our first year, we're already looking at giving, we've already uh, have said that we're giving points to both look at future conditions and climate change, but also to give points to social vulnerable, socially vulnerable communities, low and impoverished communities, and to provide more technical assistance and help so that we can help those uh, communities that have less means uh, get the right assistance to shape their projects and be competitive for future grants. So there's so much we can do um, in the equity space. So my challenge to you is that you look at your programs. I know your community in the ASFPM world uh, touches so many different programs at all different levels of government in the private sector. I ask you to help put on that lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion in everything you deliver for both programs and policy. And also to listen and learn from our customers, the, those that are most in need, and say, what are your obstacles? How can we help? How can we make this more worthwhile? And share those lessons back with us at FEMA so that we can better shape our policies, that, so we can meet the NAC recommendations of creating an equity standard, and we can do it right without our unintended consequences. It's such an exciting time. It's such an exciting topic. And I really thank you for uh, listening today. I look forward to the, the discussion. Thank you. Paul, thank you so much for those really fantastic presentations. We have had a ton of activity within the chat, lots of fantastic questions. Um, so I wanted to get us started by um, asking one of the questions that I think got the most uh, thumbs up and attention. Um, everyone, um, I think we all know that everyone is at excuse me, a different place within their efforts to learn about social justice. And it can be a really uncomfortable topic to, for us to face. Um, as a association of floodplain managers, um, we are working to try and build our racial justice competence um, to have more productive conversations. So I'm curious if you, any of you have any thoughts for us about how we can grow and continue to learn as floodplain managers and as individuals um, as we're doing this work. Um, so I will throw that question out there. Any volunteers who wants to go first and hopefully we can have a little discussion about it. Anyone first? Back here, Lori, Paul, who has thoughts? I'll jump in. I mean, I would say this is a great start having a session, a plenary on this topic, having some great speakers like Jackie and Lori present um, starts a dialogue. And at FEMA, you know, we've always thought about things like equity and social justice, but not with that as the first lens to look through, right? So we think about our outcomes and our programs, but we've recently started saying, let's look at our outcomes and our programs with a lens of, of quality. And when we start doing that, it starts opening your eyes up to things that we thought were good outcomes, but have driven perhaps unintended consequences. So uh, I'd encourage ASFPM just to continue to learn, to listen, and to dialogue with experts. Um, so the more listening we do and the more learning we do, and we're trying to do that at FEMA over the last year, um, we've actually, we have a grassroots group that I'm the executive sponsor for. It's a a coalition of the, uh, of the willing, we call it, around equity. And it's been really, through a tough year, a great forum to less listen and learn uh, and have a discussion, a really safe space to have a discussion about really hard issues. Um, and I, I love this one rule that we use, which is you're allowed to make mistakes, uh, but let's keep each other accountable, right? And if you go in with a lens of equity, in what we're delivering and what we're doing. If you think about unintended consequences, um, so looking more holistically, and if you have a safe place to kind of say, I'm gonna ask some questions that, are make you, that may make you uncomfortable or talk about things that may make you uncomfortable, and I might say something wrong, it's okay. And, but it's also okay and the right thing to do to keep each other accountable to say, that wasn't right, that wasn't the right way to say it. And let me tell you why. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Um, we've been having similar uh, conversations within my organization. Lori, did you want to add to that? 
Yeah, no, I was, I really agree with everything Paul said. And Eileen, I just so appreciate your leadership with starting a group. And I think that's one thing is just the listening and the learning and really underscoring what Paul said. There are so many resources out there and really taking advantage of those. Jackie, just from the NAACP program, climate justice program alone, there is so much there um, to give us a starting point for learning. And the only other thing I was gonna add is I think it's really important to have that core, that sort of working group like you've started Eileen, but then making sure that it doesn't get stove piped that instead questions of racial competence and social justice get infused through everything. Because when we stove type, pipe things, it's just sort of, oh, that's their group over there and they're taking care of that. And, and it can really get sort of compartmentalized and pushed aside. But when we center questions of justice, equity, um, and racial competence in everything we do, then it gets infused across our programs, our policies, and our practices. So I think that's really important as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So again, ditto to everything that Lori and Paul said. And I would just uh, pick up on this kind of notion of the importance of, of grace in these conversations, as Paul was saying as well, that, um, that, that it's important to make sure that as we begin to delve into these things that we have skilled facilitators to help if there's kind of group conversations that are happening to really make sure that there isn't harm that's caused in the effort to not do harm. <laughs> and so, and we know that there is gonna be some level of uncomfortability that's just inevitable, but there can be ways to, to mitigate it because we recognize that we, that this society, we're all raised in a racist, sexist, ableist, homophobic, xenophobic society. That's just like in the very bones of our of our society. And so to be able to detox from that takes a lot of, of process and a lot of, you know, a lot of um, dismantling and unraveling of, of, of what's been fairly baked in in some ways. And so so making sure that we that we engage groups like People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and people who are kind of trained in these things would be good. I know that there might not necessarily be resources at hand, but there are resources out there for this kind of work. And so thinking about that. And then also, also there are groups like uh, Showing Up for Racial Justice, which is, which is, and this is, this is a, for particular for some of the, um, uh, some of the, uh, groups that are white, basically, showing up for racial justice is a white group that um, that is, that really is about allyship around racial justice issues, and so they also have kind of trained facilitators that can help do self transformational processes to help to really examine how how these systems are perpetuating um, racism and oppression. So, and and also in, so both in terms of like systems and in terms of what you were asking before, for Eileen in terms of thinking individually as well as organizationally. So I would definitely recommend connecting with surge chapters or starting a surge chapter if you don't have one in your area. Because by becoming a surge chapter, then you you have access to all the different resources that they have and you become a part of a network of folks who are all on that same journey. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Great. That is fantastic advice. And um, I know really trying to find connections to those local groups um, on the ground um, as, as individuals who are working in floodplain management. I mean, making connections to the, the local communities, the individuals, and helping to elevate their stories. Um, I think our presentation, all of your presentations really demonstrated that importance. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have um, suggestions of uh, communities that have done a really good job of telling the, the human story of mitigation, um, as well as any recommendations or strategies that floodplain managers can use to better connect with the most vulnerable people in our communities. Jackie already mentioned some of the local, like surge and local groups like that, but um, any thoughts that you all have on, on ways that we can be better listeners and help elevate the stories of local communities. Oh, and also Lori, everyone wants to know how Daniel is doing. Yeah, thank, thank you for that question, Eileen. And just a brief update on Daniel. I am 
very pleased to report that Daniel did graduate high school. Um, and I, he, he did have a brief stint in college, it, but did not end up finishing college, but he has stable work. And he and his mom and his little sister, who's not a, obviously not a baby anymore, who's in high school now herself, are all still in New Orleans, but they, um, the home that they ended up in after Katrina is now under grave threat because it's, it's in a neighborhood that's gentrifying and is rapidly gentrifying. And so it's just this reminder of how much social forces and economic forces um, shape the fates of people. And so thank you everyone for listening to Daniel's story. And um, yeah, he is an extraordinary human being and um, is hanging in there. And so that's a quick update on that. And then I just to Eileen's amazing question about the, the stories and how we can tell these stories. And I love that Jackie's presentation always starts with the stories that of people she is talking about and honoring those stories. So I think, again, listening at the root of everything we do. And just one concrete example I'd love to give is, um, Oftentimes I've heard in Seattle and King County where they read their mitigation and other plans through an equity and justice lens. One of the things that I've heard some of my colleagues there that they really talk about is when they come in, for example, to talk about retrofitting a school, they are not talking about the building, they are talking about keeping children in school. And so rather than centering the building and the retrofit costs and so forth, they center what it does for the people and what it can do in terms of, again, reducing harm and suffering, but also enhancing quality of life and justice outcomes because we know the kids who aren't gonna be in school after a big disaster are much more likely to be, again, at the margins of society already. So I think how we can sort of center what the, the intervention does for the people is, is always really important in the stories. And I don't know what Paul and Jackie would add to that. Thank you. It's a great question. I think uh, my example um, about the CVCs, the community vaccination centers, was really about working with locals. Because if you try to do things just from a national headquarters perspective and you've not been in that community and you don't know the influencers, you don't know the culture, you don't know, um, you know, kind of what's happening, it's you can make a national policy and then apply it improperly. And uh, the story that I, I would tell is, is probably not one around floodplain management, but remember um, Admiral Allen, uh, I got to talk with him once and in his last federal disaster was Joplin. And I said, how did you talk uh, about mitigation uh, with the city of Joplin? He said, you don't. You find out what's interesting and what they are prioritizing. And in that case, it was like school systems. They wanted a sc strong school system. So you don't, you could go in and say, hey, let's spend a lot of money rebuilding this in a safe way, right? Uh, that doesn't resonate versus the same thing could be done by saying, you know, disruption the school systems lowers the standard of learning. If you want a good, uh, uh, a good school system, then you really need to think about continuity planning, how to, what happens when your schools go down, how, how quickly can you reestablish them, safe rooms in those communities, uh, those type of things. And now you're saying the same thing with a focus to the community's priorities, right? Now you layer equity on top of that, and we have to be a fair brokers. This is why you need to get um, groups like Jackie's involved to talk about, okay, are those the right priorities for our community? But it does start there because, you know, if you don't focus on what the local need is, I think there is gonna be very little action. All right, Jackie, anything to add to that? We are about almost at time, but I'll let you get the last word in. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just going to say in terms of an example, I would point to um, to the Gullah Geechee Nation and the St. Helena Island, work closely with Climate Central and others to 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 develop to to really look at their to have community leadership in in assessing their flood risk, mapping their flood risk. They talked they they're now in talks and, and active planning about putting together uh, Climate Central putting together an app for them. Um, around assessing flood risk. And so this is, uh, this is the kind of partnership where they're in the lead, they're saying what the needs are, 
Climate Central is serving as a technical partner, really following their their lead. And I would say those are the principles that I would uh, that I would put forward, and the practices that I would put forward as as uh, as, as examples of what both Paul and, and Lori were saying. And that um, and I would say just to that to that uh, end, in terms of thinking of that universally with all the different. Um, Association of State Flood Plain Manager members is that whether it's NAACP branches or local church groups like United Methodist Women or other EJ groups, that there, there's groups out there, frontline uh, front folks, and if you know your community, hopefully you would be able to, to find those groups, but those are some places that national organizations that have those, those branches and chapters that I would start with. Thank you. I really wish we could continue this conversation, but unfortunately, we're at time. Um, if anybody wants to uh, continue it, I encourage you to join uh, session E7 coming up on addressing social justice and floodplain management. We'll be talking a little bit more about the social justice task force and the work that um, we're hoping to do. Um, so a big virtual round of applause for all of our speakers. We really appreciate you. Um, and before we go, um, one announcement, the ASFPM Foundation is pleased to announce the prizes for yesterday's uh, student paper competition. Uh, it was extremely close, so our hats off to both competitors. The first prize, $1,000, goes to Vanessa Lee for her paper, using historical information to inform planning for floods after fires. And second prize, $750, goes to Aquisha Glenn for her paper, detecting coherent floods in the Northeast United States for flood risk management. So Congrats to both of the winners. Um, and don't forget to check out the exhibit hall and to join the virtual happy hour tonight hosted by Tetra Tech at 530 Central. So thank you all. So long, enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>